So a little disclaimer, Rosh Hashanah Christi at Texas A&M is an apologetics org. However, not everything we say is endorsed by RC National. Um, we try to examine kind of the edge topic sometimes. So not everything that comes out of my mouth might be sanctioned by RC National. So just just a heads up on that. Um, so, what's up? Oh, sorry, I should say my question? Sure. It's just too, it's, are you asking, are you affirming my answer? I mean, your, my question? Okay, so you, I'll ask, never mind. <laughs> okay, but RC's, uh, uh, are you saying the Trinity may not be a, may not necessarily be endorsed by all of them? Right? Oh, I don't know, man. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, so, this whole semester, we've been going over deconstruction and reconstruction. Um, and we've been talking about what it looks like to wrestle with your faith and ask the harder questions about faith. Um, and then kind of like break down maybe some beliefs you might hold like key um, that aren't necessarily true. And also rebuild your faith in a way that's biblical and um, works with the text and is pretty smart and intellectual in your approach. Um, so we're going we're gonna to do a little heads up. So as you all know, the topic of tonight is the Trinity. Um, the Trinity is... Quite, quite a core doctrine of Christianity. So why, why would we want to understand the Trinity? Does anybody have any thoughts on that? Well, because Jesus is God, Father is God, Holy Spirit is God. And so I want to know who God is, and they're God, so therefore I want to know what the Trinity is. Yep, solid. Yeah, what you got? created in God's image, then we would understand ourselves in the same way as it fits into the Trinity. Yep, that's awesome. Um, so I don't know if y'all remember this. If y'all were at, uh, I think, our second meeting of the semester, we had a little target, and we were talking about what is a core truth of Christianity, what's dogma, what's doctrine, um, and what's just opinion. So, like, what you need to give specific weight to um, in your own faith. And so the Trinity is right on the bullseye. Like y'all were talking about, it is who God is, um, and it is His very nature. And so if we're going to have a religion following a God, you want to know who the God is, Right. Um, so because of that, the Trinity is essential to what we're doing, um, and that's why we're talking about it tonight. So we're going to, this is kind of the layout for the night. Um, we're going to build the theology of the Trinity um, from the ground up because, you know, we're reconstructing, so you got to start with the base. Um, and so we're going to start at New Testament backing for the Trinity. We're going to move to Old Testament backing for the Trinity. Then we're going to talk just a tad, touch on a few philosophical models of the Trinity, kind of like how do we make this make sense in our brains. Um, and then we're going to talk how that applies to our own faith. And then we're going to come to a complete and utter understanding of all of God and His nature in the Trinity. Boom. That was a joke, Kish. didn't get it. Um, so the resources we're going to be using for this is um, the Triune God, which is a master lecture series by a guy named Fred Sanders, who's the professor of theology at Biola University um, in California. And super cool. I loved watching these. It felt like I was in seminary. Um, the second resource we're going to be using is the Oxford Reading in Philosophical Theology. The first chapter is on the Trinity, and it's by William Lane Craig and J.P. Moreland. Um, it, and it kind of talks about those philosophical models um, and how do we reconcile the doctrine of the Trinity within our own intellectual um, scope. And then finally, obviously all of this is based on the Bible, so we're going to be using this. If you haven't read the Bible, I would recommend it. It's a good book. Um, so a couple of terms to kind of set the stage. We're going to be throwing around around a lot of jargon. Um, and so to kind of get that down, um, the first one we're going to be talking about is adumbration. And adumbration means to shadow forth, right? Um, and so it mean, it's kind of like foreshadowing. And it's really a word that Sanders said he's only encountered in readings about the Trinity um, because the Old Testament shadows forth the Trinity. It doesn't explicitly state it, right? Um, and then the second word we're going to be using is revelation. And so revelation we're only going to be using for explicit appearances of the Trinity, like their physical presence. We're not going to be talking about like, you know, when Paul was talking about the Trinity, that was revelation. Now we're talking about like their physical pre presence in Scripture or in a scenario. Um, third, we're going to be talking about attestation. Attestation is where we see the Trinity discussed in later epistles or um, following literary works um, that follow the actual authorship of the Gospels. Um, and then another term is going to be salvation history. Um, and Sanders has a quote. And it says, The manifestation of the triunity of God connected with the accomplishing of salvation. Um, and so God's plan to view salvation as one massive plan for um, us to be saved and reconciled to God um, throughout all of time. So just kind of 
keep those in mind as we go through this. Um, so we're going to start off and we're going to try to build a biblical case for the Trinity. Um, however, we can't because the bibl- there is no biblical case for the Trinity. Surprise, meeting's over. Um, Trinity's never mentioned in the Bible, um, never once. So we're going to have to figure this out, right? Um, so like I mentioned a, mi- a moment ago, the approach we're going to be taking is we're going to start at the New Testament and work to the Old Testament. Um, and we're going to start at the revelation of the sending of the Son and the Spirit at the Incarnation and at Pentecost. Um, So like we were talking a moment ago, the Old Testament adumbrates the Trinity. And B.B. Warfield has a quote that says, the Old Testament is like a room that is richly furnished but dimly lit. Um, And so you can kind of see in this picture, like we can't really get a good scope of what's going on, but we can understand that there's things there that we need to understand, but we just can't see them yet. Um, And this is in a lot of promises that are in the Old Testament, prophecies, those sorts of things. And so as we read the Old Testament, you're kind of left on the hook. Um, But then the New Testament, the lights come on, right? And so the incarnation of Jesus and the sending of the Spirit at Pentecost are the revealing of the Trinity in Scripture, right? So we're talking about the revelation, their physical presence. Um, And it's these promises that are fulfilled in Scripture, um, all of Isaiah, et cetera, et cetera. Um, And this is something that's revealed, it's not whispered. So like we defined a moment ago, revelation is the physical presence. And so when we're thinking about the Trinity, there's not a specific line in Scripture where God kind of leans over the ramparts of heaven and goes like, Psst, hey, there's, there's three of me in here. Like, just get that straight real quick. Um, you know, like he doesn't do that. We just see three appearances of what we would consider to be the God, Godhead. And we're like, ah, what do we do with this, right? So the Trinity is a mystery. Right? It's something that we're not given in a line of Scripture. Um, and revelation of the Trinity is one that is done by the Trinity about the Trinity. Um, and there was this, I think it's John of Damascus, I believe, um, wrote this, basically this long statement on the Trinity um, in like the century following Jesus. Um, and one of the lines he used was, not even the cherubim and the seraphim know God unless God chooses to reveal that, right? And so no one knows God unless he has chosen to reveal himself in some way to you. Um, And this is a biblical mystery. And a biblical mystery is something that has always been true throughout the course of time, but that has been veiled behind God. And then at the right time, in the fullness of time, it is unveiled to be made known to us, right? Um, The gospel is also a biblical mystery. Nobody in the Old Testament knew that the gospel was going down until it did. Um, And so... The doctrine of the Trinity in Scripture is both more and less revealed. Um, And so, less revealed meaning it's not put together in a singular point of Scripture, um, but it's more revealed in the fact that it's unveiled from within the nature of God and within the character of God um, that we can see and try to process um, God's nature based off of that. So, a couple of verses that talk about revelation of the Trinity um, it's Matthew eleven twenty seven. It says, All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Right? And this shows this like this shows this dynamic between the Son and the Father that they're not they're not necessarily each other, but they have like this like connection that we're trying to reconcile as we read through this, right? Um, and then 1 Corinthians 2, 11 says, For who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except for the spirit of God. Um, and so we see this kind of same tension again, like, okay, there's God, there's a spirit of God, and they like know, know each other and they fit together, but like how do, how do we reconcile that? Because like isn't Christianity monotheism, you know? So we're going to be kind of sitting in this tension of revelation for a minute. Um, so... The center of Trinitarian theology stems from the Incarnation and from Pentecost. And the Trinity is revealed on a solely need-to-know basis, right? So no one in the Old Testament needed to know about the Trinity, right? It was not critical for Abraham, when he's like walking with Isaac up the mountain, to be like, hmm, there's like three persons in the being of God. That's really important to me right now. You know, it didn't apply because the cross hadn't come yet. um, And there was no sacrifice of the one true lamb, right? And so... The revelation of the Trinity is bound up in the gospel because it is only in the gospel that we need to know about the Trinity. Um, And so we are restored to the Father 
um, through the sacrifice of the Son, and then we're sealed with the Holy Spirit. Um, and so Ephesians 1.13 says, In Him also, when you heard the word of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in Him, you were sealed by the promised Holy Spirit. Right? So we see that the Trinity is only needed um, for the revelation of the gospel and to accomplish the gospel. Or else there's no, no need really for God to try to confuse us. You know? um, and so the Son and the Spirit, it's these two other persons we see um, in God that are revealed in the Old Testament, but who are they? So they're both divine. Um, we see that in multiple places in the Scripture. Um, and the Spirit has always been at work throughout history, right? So we see the history of the Spirit in the Old Testament, um, whether it's the pouring out of the Spirit on the elders um, of Israel or on the temple or on this one guy who, like, then designed the temple. You know, there's various places um, where that Hebrew word ruach is used. Um, and then later in Scripture, in John 1 and in Hebrews 1, um, they both attest to how the creation was formed through the Son, right? Um, and so the Son has been involved in everything from the start, and we learn this from Scripture. And so we're like, wait, I thought, I thought God the Father was the Creator, but now you're telling me, like, it was through the Son, and then, like, the Spirit was over the waters. Like, I read that in Genesis, so, like, who, who the heck created everything? You know what I'm saying? So we have this, this tension um, and then like we were talking about a moment ago, both the Son and the Spirit are necessary for our salvation. Um, and so we're going to kind of walk through a couple steps um, that get us to the doctrine of the Trinity. And so first, the first thing we need to do and take a mental step is we need to understand the concept of salvation history as a singular grand plan from the beginning of time. Right? It is a plan in which God predicted He would get the most glory. He knew He would get the most glory, and so that was the plan that was set in motion. And so we're going to use this term called the economy of salvation. And it stems from the Greek word oikonomia, I believe is how you say it. Broen can correct me because she can talk Greek. Um, and that word means a wise ordering of household management, right? So like think of, think of like an administrator, right? Um, Ephesians 1.10 translates it as plan in the ESV. It says, as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. And so it's talking about this plan to reconcile us to Christ. It's talking about the gospel. Um, and it's a wise, meticulous administration working through a plan to achieve one unified end goal. And this one unified end goal is our salvations. Our salvations, I guess it's collective. Um, and then in Ephesians 1, Paul spends the whole chapter praising this attribute of God. How he understood our wretchedness and came down and had this great plan, this grand, glorious plan of salvation from the beginning of time in which he would get the most glory and we would be reconciled to him, right? And so we see his management, this meticulous care with which God orchestrates our salvation. Uh, so that's the first step. Second step is we need to understand all of the canon of scripture as a unified narrative, right? Um, I don't know if any of y'all are fans of the Bible Project, um, I like it. But they'll say, like, you know, we believe the Bible is the unified story that leads to Jesus, right? Um, and the Bible is a unified story. Um, and this unified view of Scripture leads to a deeper understanding of God and of His nature. Because if you can read the Bible and you can see the Trinity in the Old Testament, and you can see the Trinity in the New Testament, and you can understand the way God works and understands this grand master plan of salvation as a singular whole from Genesis to Revelation, if, you can, if we can understand that and get that through our heads, then it helps us to understand God and love His Word more. And then it also helps us to see the little bits and pieces of His plan as they fall into place. Instead of like, oh, okay, so, you know, it's just like Leviticus is just this book of rules. Well, yes, it's a book of rules, but the book before it, Exodus, ends with Moses trying to enter the temple. And then he can't enter the temple because he's unclean, Right? And so then Leviticus is, well, how do we enter the temple? We want to become clean, right? And so we understand this whole unification of Scripture, not isolated books that are just rules, right? Or stories, right? It's a unified whole that points us to the gospel and to our salvation and to God's glory. And this is a really cool graphic. Um, I saw it a couple of years ago. It's all the cross-references in the Bible. Um, it's freaking sick. There's thousands of lines. Um, and apparently you have to pay for the high PDF version. So if it's Blurry. My apologies. What is the one little black ring? 
doesn't reference itself. Wh which one? Like, okay, so there's a very small part where there's basically cross references everywhere, except for this one little tiny rainbow in the middle. Well, the lack of a rainbow. Oh, it's. Which uh, one of those? Do we know? I don't. If you look at the if you understand. look at the really long white line on it, it's a little bit to the right of that. Yeah. I have no idea. I'm just curious. I want to look at which see two it. books are not getting along together. I don't know. Maybe it's the I have no idea. But that's the second step. Third step is we want to understand salvation history. And we want to understand how the Bible points to God. Um, and we want to take this and we want to apply it to our understanding of God's identity. Right? Um, and so how does God revealing himself in Scripture affect our view of him? Right? Most of y'all are familiar with the Bible and that the Old Testament doesn't just give you one-liners, right? The Old Testament simply will tell you a story. And from that story, you're supposed to infer something about the character of God. Um, and you're supposed to come to terms and wrestle with that. So how do the sending of the Son and the sending of the Spirit, what do those tell us about God's identity? Um, so this is, this is time for some philosophy, right? This is where we're going to get a little, a little crazy for a sec. Um, but before we do that, does anybody have any questions about a biblical understanding of the Trinity? Um, well, because it's deconstruction, and so we're, it's quite literally deconstruction. <laughs> so, <laughs> question about the Trinity. Okay. Anything? Cool. Um, so, I can add one just for the sake of the video. Do okay. you think that the biblical there are uh, ways of interpreting the Bible that would leave the Trinity out that seem valid? Uh. No, because I'm orthodox. Um, but there are people that try to argue that, and that's exactly what we're about to talk about. So we're going to move on to some philosophical models about the Trinity. And right here we have a very, very, very well-drawn uh, meticulous graph that I did with lines. Um, and it kind of shows the spectrum of interpretations on Trinitarian doctrine. And so on the far left you see that we have Unitarianism. Unitarianism, yeah, that's right. Um, <laughs> it simply means that there's one, there's no trinity. There's one. That's it. That's all God is. He's one. Um, and then it, on the far right side, um, we have what's called the maximalist interpretation of Scripture. And then one step in from the maximalist, we have social Trinitarianism. And one step in from Unitarianism, we have um, what's called the anonymous threeness revelation. And then kind of right in the middle of those, we have traditionalist Trinitarianism. So, what do all these big words mean? So, on the minimalist side, we have Unitarianism, and so Unitarianism rejects the doctrine of the Trinity entirely. Um, and if y'all were here for the first meeting of the semester, um, that was when Zach was talking about deconstructing from oneness Pentecostal, um, which means they didn't believe in the Trinity. So the Unitarianist would believe that the incarnation and the sending of the Spirit don't tell us anything about God. Um, like they were like, yeah, that helped get us saved but we don't know that, that we can't infer anything based off of that, right? We just, there was a son, there was a spirit, and God's, God's God. It doesn't have any effect on our beliefs on him. And then one step in from that is the anonymous threeness revelation, um, which would say that the son and spirit are eternal beings, but they only became the son and spirit for our salvation. And so it's kind of like these like three nameless figures just kind of floating up in space. And then... For our salvation, they put on the hats of the Son and of the Spirit, but we really don't know anything. You know, it's like they just put on a costume to save us, and then, like, there's some vague identity up in heaven. Um, so it's just kind of like an unlabeled Trinitarianism. And then, one one verse that I would use to argue that would be Matthew twenty-eight nineteen, which says, "Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit." Um, and so we see in one verse that all three beings are present, right? So I would say that that refutes Unitarianism, but hmm, some people like to argue. Um, on the maximalist side of things, right, so now we're swinging all the way to the other side of the spectrum. The maximalist takes all historical revelation about God um, and takes that up into the being of himself. Um, and so everything historical that God has ever interacted with in Scripture is ingrained into his character. And it's like this super, like, everything has to come into God's character. Like, we can't discern anything or, like, can't cipher through anything. Nothing like that. 
It's everything that happened is God's character. And so it's a super close tying of the two, of his character and history. Um, and then one step in from that side, or extremist side, would be social Trinitarianism. And social Trinitarianism would say something like, well, we see three distinct persons in Scripture, and, like, the Son obeys the Father and, like, submits to Him, and, like, the Spirit is sent from the Son, so there has to be some form of, like, submission within the being of the Trinity, and we see Him talk to each other, like, they're being social, right? So, therefore, like, they have to be separate, because when I talk to you, I'm not you, but we're separate, so, like, therefore, the beings in the Trinity must be separate, right? And it's kind of like that, just kind of parsing through it, reasoning through it, um, that would be valid if there wasn't an Old Testament, but that's cool. Um, so now, traditionalist Trinitarianism um, says that from all eternity, there has been the distinction between the Father and the Son and the Spirit. And those are who those beings are, right? Um, so the Son is eternally begotten from the Father, and the Spirit eternally proceeds from the Father and from the Son. And so we see, like we were talking about earlier, that in the economy of salvation, the Son and Spirit have missions um, to save and redeem us and to bring God glory. And so in the revelation of those two, um, this activates an eternal procession within God. Um, and so a procession within God is a going forth from God within the being of God that doesn't necessarily go outside of God. So like a character if you want to put it in human terms, like a character quality that is in God and then is activated by a need and like say like, you know, you're a compassionate person. So when that need comes, you show compassion, right? Like that would be a kind of a way to align that in human, really, really, really basic human terms and it's heretical. So don't take that as a model of the Trinity, but that would be kind of like the idea. Um, and so the eternal son would always be sent forth from the father and would always be begotten of the father even if he was never sent to us for our salvation, right? And so if he never crossed the great divide and came down to die on the cross, the son would still be the son and he would still be the second person of the Trinity, right? Like it's his character. It didn't change because we needed a savior. It was that way um, from all eternity. And so what are the three of them in God? Anybody, anybody got an idea? Like what a label on it? Persons. Persons. That's a great Hypostases. word. Hypostases. Oh my Greek. goodness. We're gonna we're gonna talk about that in just just like one slide. That's so good. Um, so we know that there's one God, right? Um, because based off of Deuteronomy six four, Hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. So we have verses in the Old Testament that point us to a single monotheistic God. Um, however, in the New Testament and in the revelation of the two Son and the Spirit. Um, we see relationships form between these different aspects of the Godhead. Um, and so the word that we like to label that with is person. And so we're going to have to be cautious here for a second because when I say a person, you know, you would probably think your mom or your dad or like, you know, your friend, your roommate. And those are, the, we have very like, there's a lot of baggage that comes with that word. Um, you know, a person is separate from me and separate from any other person, but they have like these emotions that aren't aligned with anybody else's. So there's just a lot of baggage. And so we're going we're gonna to just put that label of person um, on the beings of the Trinity. And we're going to, this doesn't really enrich our theology. It's not taking any of that baggage into the Trinity, but it's simply just a label we're going to use to make them distinct. Because the closest thing we can kind of come up with would be person. Um, and so we have these, um, these necessary relations within God, right? Um, and a necessary relation would be like, so say my, my relationship with God. Um, as human beings, we are dependent on God to sustain us, right? He, he's the giver of life, etc. cetera. Um, and so it is necessary that we depend on him. However, he does not depend on us. If I disappear tomorrow and somehow just got like bleeped off the earth, like, God wouldn't necessarily, like, God wouldn't be affected. Nothing about his character would change, right? Because he's not dependent on me. However, within the internal life of God, we see that there are these necessary relationships that are eternal and uncreated, and the need of the Father for the Son and the Spirit, and the reliance upon each other, and the community, and the love 
for each other within the very Trinity itself, um, which is awesome. And then this this really is a really cool line I heard. Um, ex- the external actions of God are united, but the internal actions are distinguishable. And so, like operating as a unit in their interactions with creation or in humanity, the Trinity is united. But within each other, there's a there's a social aspect. There's a love. There's a relationship between all three persons of the Trinity. Um, so any questions? That's kind of just like a brief view of philosophy. If you want to break your brain on it, you can go read that book I had at the beginning. It definitely took me a hot minute to like try to understand. Can you define person? Person. Um, so, so like I said, we're just kind of using that as a label to say someone who, like an individual, right? Someone who is um, set apart and distinct um, from others. But in the Trinity, we know they're unified, right? So we don't want to take everything we know about a person and apply it to the Trinity. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, any others? Yeah. The, tradi- the traditionalist Trinitarian viewpoint wouldn't hold to any sort of social relationship between three persons? No, no, not necessarily. Um, like I was saying, there are these relationships within the Trinity that are needed um, and are used for and have been there since all eternity. Um, but the social Trinitarian, which is kind of on the maximalist side, would say that because we see these social Trinitarians, we know they're separable. We see these social relationships, and a relationship can't happen within myself. So they're saying that they're not united as one being? Yes. Oh, okay. And so you kind of see this, like, three-person, it's really hard to justify. So then to confirm, all of the heresies would fall outside of the traditionalist uh, Trinitarian, and only orthodoxy would be on that boat? Yes, that's... That's what I would think. Um, so, now that we've gotten some biblical case for it and some philosophical models on how do we kind of like make the Trinity fit within our heads, um, how would this apply? Anybody, anybody have any ideas on how all of this like fancy jargon or doctrine would affect us? Well, your theology can often have unintended consequences or, you know, like Trinitarian theology can end up having unintended consequences on other aspects of your theology. Um, you see a lot of different churches have different views of the Trinity, and that can in turn be seen to affect their different views on doctrine. So yeah. on the one hand, that, but on the other, you know, knowing that Jesus is the Son of God and knowing his relationship to the Father is pretty important in understanding the gospel. Yep, I would definitely agree. So. Yeah, I mean, without the Trinity, Christ isn't God, and it's hard to see how his death did what it did for us in terms of our sins. And then without an understanding of the Trinity, I think there is something to be said about the aspect of the relationship and the love and the community that's within God himself inherently. That, um, I mean, with it, without that being part of him, it's hard to see why that's such an important part of humanity. So I think just like if you're thinking about who, what, what characteristics would a god who had designed people the way he did have to have? Uh, community seems to be one of them, and it's kind of interesting when you're thinking about your typical theistic god that they don't really have uh, any any way that that's an inherent kind of something that you would think that like the god of Islam would value for some reason. Mm. But in Christianity, it makes a lot more sense. Yeah, I would um, go off what Katie is saying is that the community comes from the personhood of of the uh, Trinity, that um, God is personal, each of the members of the Trinity is a person, and that's where we get our idea of person from. Um, so, uh, I, you know, what you said is correct, we still, it's a bad analogy to reason that they're the same type of person, but I think we actually have to reason from the other way. We have to reason that um, God is a person, or God, God is personal, you know, three persons, God is three persons, and then we are persons. So what does that mean for us? What does that mean for our community? What does that mean for human rights? What does that mean for how we love each other? Um, yeah. And that's what we talked about some in the morality debate that we had with SSA last semester. One of Zach's big points was God is a person, and so, you know, we are valuable as people because God is himself, you know, personal. But then also, like they were saying, the whole fact that the Holy Spirit, the, the Holy Trinity is this community of love where all three persons can be said to love one another is a reflection on the fact that we're supposed to love one another and to love God and to yeah. love us. 
Yeah, the fact that God is in community is why we need to be in community. Yeah. I think the, um, you know, people say that God is eternally loving. And you're like, well, how could God have been eternally loving if there wasn't anything for a hot minute? You know, and then you look at the Trinity and kind of look inside the divine life. Um, and it's just a really cool aspect of the God we get to serve and love. So, Katie? I guess I think on another side, too, I, I, this is not really a philosophical or um, any type of point like that, but you just have... The, I, li I like that in uh, Christianity, when you look at uh, the theistic God of Christians versus like a lot of other theistic gods, he's not necessarily simple. And I don't say simple in like the philosophical sense, um, but I say simple more as um, he's a little bit hard to wrap your head around and understand. And I think just having been a scientist, study the world and trying to understand what it's like, um, it isn't simple either. So it kind of makes sense that the God who made it would not be easy to... Uh, just fit in a box in your head. Yeah. C.S. Lewis made that point, I think, in Mere Christianity. He said, you know, the world isn't simple. You know, the laws that govern us aren't simple. The truth isn't simple. So therefore, you know, if religion is supposed to be explaining all of that, why should it be simple? Yeah. Any others? Just, just to kind of, I guess, get all that into one nice little um, almost proposition, but uh, it's a Thomistic principle um, that effects are virtually contained within the cause. Well, God is the cause of creation. He's a trinity. All creation, which is the entire, which is everything that's not him, are contained within him as a cause. Yep. So, everything is trinitarian. In some way. In some formal way. Cool. Yes. Sweet. So, um, one thing I would like to point to is Spurgeon's Catechism number one. Um, and it says that man's chief glory is to, or man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Um, and that's just a, a little one-liner that's definitely caused me to wrestle, um, because enjoying God, knowing God, glorifying God, right? In order to glorify and to enjoy God, we need to know who God is. Like if I told you I enjoyed strawberries, but I never had a strawberry before, you'd think I'm whack. You know, so we need to know who God is in order to enjoy Him and to glorify Him and appreciate Him. Um, and so, in the Old Covenant and in the Old Testament, we have that adumbration aspect um, that we were talking about a little bit earlier, um, which means to shadow forth, right? And so, if we kind of just parse through Scripture, um, little parts make sense on their own, but a comprehensive understanding of the whole of Scripture. Um, allows us to come to a deeper knowledge and a deeper love for the Scripture and the triune God behind the Scripture. And so, one thing that Sanders points out, um, this is hard for anybody here to do, maybe most, most people here, would be to like read through the entire Scripture from Genesis to Revelation, just straight through, right? Because the whole time, if you've never read the Bible before, you're like hanging on the edge of your seat, like what happens next? Who are these judges? Like, oh wait, there's this like promise that we're supposed to be holding on to, like, what, what's happening, you know, and you kind of don't see it, and then you understand the sinning of the Son, the sinning of the Spirit, um, kind of answer a lot of those questions. And then after you understand the entire whole of Scripture, going back and reading it again the same way, um, kind of you now have the end in mind, um, and you kind of get like this new lens to interpret the Old Testament to. And so where do we see the Trinity in the Old Testament? There's this, there's this one thing um, I like to trip about sometimes. It's called a Christophany. You can ask B. We'll stay up to like one just talking about them. Um, but we need to be careful because we don't want to just like point to any like angelic being in the Old Testament and be like, that was Jesus right there. Boom. Like, I don't know how he came out of Mary, but that's, that's got to be Jesus, right? Um, you know, and it's like the guy that's wrestling Jacob or the angel of the Lord that leads Joshua um, or the fourth figure in the fire, right? And so we need to be careful when we address this topic because we need to recognize that um, if there is a Christophany in the Old Testament, which is an appearing of Christ, um, we need to recognize that there's, totally, there's still total equality with God um, in, that, in the Son manifested there. Um, and God has the freedom to reveal Himself through created phenomena the way He wants. Um, so we just need to be careful when we approach those and don't want to label every single thing as Jesus Himself. Right? So... 
That's one aspect. And then, what's up? Well, so the well, so the idea behind a Christophany is that it's Jesus Himself, like it is the Son, and it's the Son like that's wrestling Jacob, and then you know you're kind of like, well, was the Son the collection of cells that came out of Mary? Because if so, how the heck did he wrestle Jacob? You know, you kind of get yourself in this like mind warp. Um, so we just kind of need to be careful with the way that we approach this. Sam, you look like you have something to say. Yes. I don't know. I feel in like some ways, probably disagree. It's not like him in the flesh because him coming in the flesh was only after the incarnation. Uh, you know, where he was born of Mary and became man. I think in the Old Testament, it's not him in the flesh, but it's him in some other form of revelation. Yeah, sure. Maybe in some sort of other incarnate well, form, as it were. Like a, not, like a physical not being. Not as the same. Not Jesus, not you know, in the, New the deep. The yes. Yeah, something yeah. like that. Angel. Yeah, like like a physical being, maybe, but not necessarily like the DNA of who we know as Jesus Christ. I mean, I think a way out of this, um, Christian, feel free to correct me, but that Jesus is fully God and fully man, mm-hmm. the other appearances of um, the person of, of the Son don't have to be fully man. Mm-hmm. So they could be you know, fully God, like it's an appearance, but it doesn't have to be actually a man um, before he became it right before he became yep. man right but when of course man comes back again fully fully god fully man yeah but this is you know incarnation is fully god fully man appearances don't have to be wait yep. but to be clear have we ruled out that god could or jesus couldn't have after his resurrection and his resurrection god he just gone back in time and then <laughs> what <laughs> uh, i mean are we sure <laughs> sweet um, that would depend on your theory of time. <laughs> I'm not ruling that out. I was just giving uh, a yeah. solution. <laughs> yeah, I'm saying a solution is, is, is thing that wouldn't <laughs> require that, you know. So yeah. uh, you don't have to say that the, the appearances were fully man. That yep. Yeah. That's super helpful way to look at that, yeah. I mean, God appeared to Moses in a burning bush, Exactly. Right? So it doesn't have to even be. And sometimes, I think in the Old Testament, it is... Uh, characterized as a- an angel so even spiritual beings can manifest where people can see them right mm-hmm. so I mean anyway yeah I, I I think I agree that yeah the in- incarnation is the incarnation right yep. but but these these uh, previous appearances pro- are we wouldn't call them 100%. the incarnation yeah in also to clarify, when an angel appears as a man, it's not fully man. This is also what is so cool about the incarnation is that God is yeah, fully man. Fully man. Yeah. Um, fully God. An angel just appears as a man. Yep. Yeah. So, lots to lots to wrestle with, and lots that we need to be careful with when, like, trying to view those in the Old Testament, right? Um, and then another thing, another way that we can kind of apply the doctrine of the Trinity to our lives, um, is this idea of convergent hyper fulfillment. And so if you just read the Old Testament straight through, you're kind of like left on the end of it and you're like, you have all these expectations, all these open promises, these unfulfilled prophecies um, that are really vague and quite sporadic and all over the place if you've just read the Old Testament, right? Like you're, you're waiting for the Lord himself to come into his temple. You're waiting for the Spirit of God to be poured out on all people. You're waiting on another prophet like Moses. You're waiting on David's greater son. You're waiting on the suffering servant of Isaiah 55, 53. Um, and so there's just all these, like, all these aspects, and you're like, oh, my gosh. Like, do we, are we waiting on, like, 10 people? Like, is God, like, going to send, like, 20 people, like, to come fulfill this? And you're like, ah, uh, how do we wrestle with this? Um, and that's where the New Testament comes in, and we get to understand that fulfillment. And so instead, all of these are fulfilled in the arrival of the Son, in the power of the Spirit, and in the giving of the Spirit, um, to fulfill all these Old Testament expectations. So the Spirit is poured out on the people. The Son is the suffering servant and the prophet like Moses, and He does come and tabernacle among us, right? Um, John one fourteen, I think. Um, and so we have all of these fulfilled in the Son and in the Spirit, right? Um, because at the end of the day, the revelation of the Trinity is about showing the revelation of the Gospel and about, com- like, saving us, right? 
because we're all sinners and we're all broken and we're all separated from God um, because we go against God. And so in order to be reconciled to God, God himself came down and was the sacrifice and paid the punishment that we deserved on the cross and took on the entirety of the wrath of God um, in our place. And so, like Romans 10, 9 says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And so if we place faith in Christ and make him Lord and ruler over every aspect of our life, we get new life and we get eternal salvation and we get to be sealed by the Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. And we get to be part of that people who the Spirit is poured out on, right? That is predicted thousands of years ago in Joel 2, right? And so it's this beautiful fulfillment of all of Scripture. You're left with the Old Testament and you kind of like have all these like, you know, random loose strands that you need to get a hold of and they all come to one place and that's the gospel and that's God's glory in the redemption of man and our salvation right point blank period that's it so we have to understand that the revelation of the trinity is about the gospel Um, and so with that we have a couple of we can now kind of take that lens that we understand our sinfulness and our need for a savior and we can understand how the different aspects or the different persons of the Trinity play into our own life. And we can kind of take those back and look back on the Old Testament and identify people within the Old Testament. And so once we've met these persons of the Trinity, we can try to find them in the Old Testament like we were talking about. So whether that's a Christophany, right, or and maybe that's the son, or like Exodus 23, 20 through 21 says, I'm going to send an angel before you and my name is in him. Um, and so Sanders argues that God is putting his name in the angel that is leading um, Israel. Or when the Lord sends his word um, in the Old Testament. In, in John 1, we see that the word is someone, that the word was flesh and dwelt among us, right? Um, and then obviously Psalm 110.1, 1, which is the most quoted passage of Scripture in the New Testament. Um, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand and I'll make your enemies a footstool under your feet. Um, is the Father saying to the Son and putting all of creation under the Son's feet, right? And so we can kind of start to see these things in the Psalms, which, you know, at face value are worship songs, right? You know, and we can see him in the Old Testament when he's leading Israel out of Egypt, and we can see it in the prophets, in Malachi, in Joel, in all these different things. We can kind of look back and use our knowledge of the Trinity and the way that applies to our life and the whole canon of scripture being about salvation and we can take that and use that as a lens to look back on the old testament right um and so then as we understand the unification of scripture and the revelation of the trinity um to the end of the gospel we come to a deeper understanding of who god is we come to a deeper love of who god is we come to a greater sense of awe at the way that this supernatural being has unfolded the entirety of history and of creation for our salvation. And so we can be reconciled with the loving Father, right? When we repent of sin and we place our trust in Him, we get to see this grand this grand plan and this beauty that then helps us to grow in our maturity as Christians or helps us to appreciate the gospel for the work that it is. It's not... Oh, we, we, we were supposed to die, so like God came down and died for us. Yes, he, he did. But it's this much more beautiful reconciling of us to himself through the sacrifice of the Son and through the sealing of the Spirit. Um, and so as we come to understand the Trinity, we understand the gospel deeper. And we get to have more joy in the Lord. And we get to have more growth in the Lord. Um, and so these are the takeaways. Um, takeaway slide if you want to take a picture or whatever. Um, But basically, the Trinity is essential to the Christian faith. It's a core doctrine um, because it is essential to the economy of salvation and to the nature of God himself. So it's who God is. It's how he saved us. And so therefore, it's it's needed if you're going to be a Christian. Um, The Trinity is revealed by the Trinity on a need-to-know basis in the sending of the Son and the Spirit, right? People in the Old Testament didn't need to know about the Trinity. And so it was only adumbrated. It wasn't revealed. But... We're under the new covenant, so we need to know about the Trinity. Um, And then as we come to understand the Bible as a whole, we get a deeper knowledge of the Trinity and of the plan of the Trinity, which is the gospel um, and our salvation, and each person of the Trinity's role throughout the entirety of Scripture. Um, 
And then, obviously, the core truth that the Trinity is one being compromised of three co-equal, co-powerful, co-eternal persons. Um, and because of that, we get to walk in newness of life. So, anybody, anybody got any questions? I'll leave the takeaway slide up, but anybody got any questions? Is this a final Q and A questions? Yeah. Okay. So, well, actually, okay. Then I do have a question. Um, do you think a part of the, necessary to the Trinity is divine simplicity? Can you define divine simplicity? But divine simplicity is uh, basically that God's being. Well, for one of the implications is that God's being is His essence, but God is absolutely and completely simple in His being. There can be no divisions. No distinctions. No distinctions. No, 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 no. There can be distinctions. You, there, uh, you can't. The God has any copies. Not exactly. God has no composition. Is how we would in, in without parts. Without parts. Without composition. Well, so correct me if I'm wrong on the official name for that, but like if we view. Like that there's one God and three parts of him. Like, you know, you take like a kettle or whatever and you like pour it out into three cups. Like they're all still the same like original water from the kettle, but it's three manifestations of it. Um, the technical term for that, I believe, is modalism, right? Um, and Yeah. <laughs> it's modalism. Um, it's partial, partialism. Partialism. Modalism okay. is there's one God that just has manifestations three, three, manifestations. three manifestations of it. Partialism is the part the persons are three different distinct parts of God. Yes. Um, like parts of the essence of the whole essence. Yes. And so we, we want to be cautious when we're using that there like God has composition and he's comprised the parts because we don't want to say that, you know, the sun's only like a third of the divine being, right? Or the spirit's only a third. Like there's one sanctioned off like this is the sun, this is the spirit. Right? So we need to that's, it's also like one of the things that our brains can't necessarily comprehend in a full model, um, but we kind of get these like different doctrines and like different philosophical understandings of it. Um, try to reconcile those um, within themselves, knowing that we're going to be sitting in attention because the Trinity is reasonable, like it is unable to understand, but at the same time, like it's it's not completely completely comprehensible in that you're going to nail down. The way it works and all that. If you want to answer my question, would you say divine simplicity is necessary? And you don't know if that doctrine is sufficiently no, not, not well enough to, to answer that okay, question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's very, very fair. Mm. Julie, you don't hold divine simplicity, right? Yeah, I mean, it's debated whether, uh, and of course, how you would, you know, a Thomistic understanding of simplicity. I think that. Um, for a Thomist, it is necessary, right? For a Catholic, it's necessary. Yeah. yeah. But it goes back to the Cappadocians and St. Augustine held it too. Yeah. Yeah. Hold it in the St. Thomas. Importantly, uh, the main source for studying William, like Frank, is denies the So, um, like I, yeah, that shows Colin that it, it's. Pinkenga also denies, by, denies, well, denied divine simplicity. So. There are philosophers it's, that would say that. The Trinity is an entail of divine simplicity, yeah. if that makes but, sense. But there's also a spectrum of what people mean by divine simplicity. That is true. I mean, I, I think you'd have to, you know, clarify your... Because if you define clarify simplicity clarify your as merely saying there's no composition in God, then, you know, William, William Lane Craig's not going to deny that. Um, if you say that, consequently, God has no properties, that you can't speak of properties of God, uh, that's when he's going to say no, that... That's not a rational inference. Well, divine Thomas wouldn't say that God doesn't have properties, but it really depends on what you mean by properties, what I would say. Well, yeah, I mean, that's not exactly Thomistic language, right? So. Well, Aquinas does talk about properties. It just depends on what you mean by properties, because there's a modern definition of properties as like a kind of a part in the modern. Well, no, a property is a part, isn't a part, but. Right, that's what I'm saying. Modern philosophers tend to view properties as parts, but in classical philosophy, Aristotle and Aquinas, a, a property isn't necessarily a part. Is, is not necessarily a part. But I guess the point is, uh, generally speaking, I, I think even better view is, I think simpler than that, just we've got properties. Does God, does God have parts? 
Would you say gun has parts? Well, it, it again depends, depends how you define part. Like, are you trying to say that each... A part is dependent on its whole, right? So there's in some way divisible, right? Well, it, it also depends how you define divisible because then we approach, like if you're talking about like within the Trinity itself, like then we're approaching social Trinitarianism, which says that you can separate all different parts, like they're different, distinguishable, distinct beings, separable beings. Yeah, I'm asking right? according to traditional, but, your traditional view of Trinitarianism. Yeah. But if we're trying to understand like that the Trinity has distinct persons in it that are unified in the being of God and are three persons within God, uh, that's I think where that kind of tension lies. And so it, it would depend how you define divisible part, like all those would be like down in the nitty gritty on that. And we kind of have to keep in mind that it's not necessarily something we can fully understand how three things are completely one and distinct. And so, you know, if we're gonna get into what we mean by divisible, like we're gonna have to go there as well, so. I mean, I think in classical Protestantism, everyone would pretty much deny that you could somehow cut the son off from the father and spirit and have that be okay. Which, if that's what you're kind of going for in divine simplicity, the idea is simply that you can't, you know, you can't subdivide God. You can't take him apart into the different aspects and still have him remain what he is. So it's it would be the same kind of idea as if you cut the person of Jesus off from God. That, do, that doesn't make any sense. I don't think any Protestant would say that you can. Um, but you're going to have different philosophical language and how that's couched. Are there things that you can say about the Son that you can't say about the Father? He died on the mm. cross. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't know mm. when the Lord will, or when he will return. Well, you no know, one knows the hour or day except the, the Father. Son is, oh. The Son is... Uh, Son is fully God and fully man, right? Right? Isn't that something you can say about the Son? You can't say about the Father. What do you mean by Son? Like the incarnate word Son, the Son of Man, or the Son of God? Person. Yeah, no, I would say the Son of God and the Son of Man. The, the two, the human nature and the divine nature, are both in the same person. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm asking you. There's a difference. I'm not, I'm not saying that the. the that Christ is incarnate in his divine nature, right? Because that you know, it's not the divine nature that is yeah. flesh, right? But um, that's something you can say about the, the divine nature of Christ is attached to the human nature, right? Like that's, like, as a unit, like Christ is also a unified whole, right? His two natures aren't separable. So when we speak of Christ, we're speaking of Christ as a whole. To say Christ has a human nature, the Son has a human nature, is a statement we can make about the Son that we can't make about the Father. The Father doesn't have a human nature, right? Yeah, I'm just pointing out though that, okay, so sometimes in, Catholic, in the Catholic tradition, we say the Son of Man is the divine, or is the human nature. So like, that's why I said, what do you mean by Son? Yeah, I just mean whole. whole. Okay. Then in that case, if you mean like the whole person, there's actually nothing you can't say. There is actually nothing you can't apply to the Son and the Father. If you mean the divine person, then all idioms, all co idioms can, uh, are equally communicated between the Father yeah, and the Son. and that's the consequence of divine simplicity, right? right. It, so that's the sort of thing that I mean. That's, I think, why a lot of Protestant analytical philosophers will deny divine simplicity, at least the format of it, that's going to result in that in that you can't say things about Christ that you that aren't true of the Father, right? We're getting kind of far afield from the Trinity, though. No, but I don't think so. <laughs> well, I yes did, no, did the I divine mean, nature die on the cross? The nature can't die. Well, well, it's yeah, only a person who dies. Die. Yeah. Did the divine nature experience what Christ experienced on the cross today? Did so the divine nature cease to exist? So the divine nature died. I don't think it's what proper to say that a nature can die. I thought that everything we applied to God or to Jesus has to be applied to the whole person of Jesus. Not to the not the human nature. Really? 
that was part of like the communicatio idiomatum. No, the communicatio idiomatum is actually what tries to distinguish between the divine nature and the human nature in the one person. So there's a divine hypostasis and two fuses in okay. one this person. This is supposed to be what your example was, which was the omniscience question. Right? Mm. Any other thoughts? <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'm not. I'm still not 100% certain, even after all that stuff. How the the whole Jesus dying on the cross, or the Son dying on the cross, whether that was God, a part of God. Like it sounds like y'all wouldn't say that it was a part of God, or at least depend. It would depend on how you would consider the Trinity. It, would, it was God, but I, like that's it. Not a part. It's not a part of God, but it's also not the Father and the Son, but it's it's its distinct thing, but that's why I was, it seems... It's a person of God, so I don't know if you said this or not, but a way sometimes to help think about fundamentally what the Trinity is, like the, the fundamental distinction, so we think of a human person. A human person is one essence, one entity, and one person. Mm -hmm. So what we are claiming about God is that God is one essence, one entity, but three persons. So they share a being, but they have distinct personalities, distinct, distinct centers of will, kind of, if you can think of that. So Christ is one of those three persons, completely part of this, completely the divine essence, you know, sharing in the divine essence. I think I'd have to understand the difference of the essence of a, the essence and a person, like what exactly you're meaning by dividing those two things, and because that I'm still not, I'm not 100 percent certain what you're t like when you're like there's the essence of a person, there's an essence and then there's a person. So yeah, I mean you have to first uh, acknowledge the existence of an essence, right? Well, well there that, is like a fundamental entity. Are you, are you referring to something similar to like the soul? Like there's the soul of a per or is it, that's what I'm, Well, it, so, yeah, I mean, so kind of. Um, is, so, think about what we mean by a person. A person is a center of the will, right? Like a person is a thing that can make a choice, that can, that has a, a, a self-experience. Yeah, I would, I would say it would be like a conscious entity. Sure, mm -hmm. or consciousness part. Yeah. yeah. Um, now imagine if, you were you, but there were three persons in you, kind of. Like three sources of consciousness so within the, you. The issue is so that you can't imagine it, but you, by understanding the categories, you can see that it's not a contradiction. So I, well, that's what I'm, I'm trying to, I'm not certain what the, ca I'm not certain how, I think I'm confused on to where the difference in categories of the essence is compared yeah, to where the category of a person, like, well, the, the point is, if you the like, if you're just thinking of people, you're never going to get the distinction, right? Because well, I was there is every person is always one and one. Think about it as like a three-headed dragon, where each head has its own like Ooh, what it wants to do and how it's pr it's probably <laughs> slightly yeah. a yeah. well. Funny well, enough, I was trying to dodge most of these. Are we saying there's three wills in God? That's like see that. <laughs> Are there three is that what's being said? Is, is that will. different? <laughs> you mean will is in like plan and purpose, though. But if you mean will is in like Christ uh, and the Father aren't like they're there are thinking different thoughts. There's three centers of action, sort of. But yes. So there's yeah. three minds. Three-headed dragon. Yeah, three the dragon three only can God. walk in one direction. <laughs> <laughs> So, can I give, Go ahead. I, just so that you know this answer, Caleb, there, the argument that Andrew is giving is that the definition of essence and the definition of person uh, do not contradict each other when you say there could be one essence but three persons. Yeah, I, I recognize um, that. Right. And now there are people that would argue that, that there is a contradiction. Yeah. Like there are, um, you know, non-Orthodox or, you know, um, mm -hmm. atheist philosophers of religion who would argue that um, there is a contradiction in the Trinity. Mm -hmm. um, but there are reasons to say there isn't one, um, mm -hmm. and this is really 
you know, this is something, we're not just playing with words here, of course, we're playing with um, what actually is, yeah. but there, it's not intuitive to us, so it's hard mm -hmm. to, to understand yeah. that, so. Yeah. It, the, re the reason why this is so confusing to me is because, like, part of the I idea of this with the whole trinity is the son being crucified. It was, like, would you, you couldn't, would you say that, like, God was crucified? I don't think you would say that, but saying that was he wasn't. Yeah, 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 yeah God, God like, some would say that, God, but, fully man. right, but you wouldn't say, like, the Father or the Holy Spirit was crucified. Correct. Yes. So... There, that would seem to indicate that God was crucified in the second person. Right, but that that would seem to indicate that like the Son is its own thing, but you're all, the Trinity is kind of it. It's also not its own thing. Yeah. 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 So yeah. The of the that's the Trinity. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So it's yeah. so in one sense you could you're saying that God crucified was crucified, which. Mm -hmm. He knew, but it wasn't really him that. That's why I'm. It's. It, it wasn't. It wasn't so, well, no, what I mean yeah. is like he. Jesus knew. So, Jesus was fully God and fully right. man. But it was he. God sacrificed himself in a way. Yes. 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 yes exactly. But also not due to the Father and the. That's why it's. Well, so so the Son, the Father doesn't have a physical nature, right? right. But the Son the, has a physical nature. And so Andrew was touching on that a moment ago. And so in order to be executed by Roman humans, you would need, you, to be you would need a physical to be being. a physical being. And so Christ came down incarnate as the Son, and that was when the revelation of the Son occurred. And then when he was crucified, he was physically crucified. And he had, A, yes, the wrath of Rome dumped out on him, mm -hmm. but he also had the wrath of God on sin dumped out on him. And so... And because so, God is God is three persons in one being, mm -hmm. right? The Son can be crucified while the Father inflicts the wrath on sin. Wrath so, and separation. But so it it so, but it sounds a lot like God sacrificed himself to himself. Yes. To save us from the himself. wrath of himself. Yes, that's exactly and that, that, that that's seems, exactly what the whole gospel is, is because we are sinners and we are worthy of damnation and we are worthy of eternal separation from God. It's just say, so, say, saying it like that doesn't make any sense to me. Well, so so justice under... Like, under so, I'm just going to say that the best that you can ask for without accepting revelation is mm -hmm. an argument to show it is not inconsistent. Um, you can't go about proving that things like the Trinity, things like the Incarnation without accepting revelation first. Mm -hmm. So if you're confused about an aspect of Revelation that's all well and good, but it's an aspect mm -hmm. of Revelation, and we can show you it's not inconsistent, mm -hmm. so we can show you that you can rationally hold to it and you're not yeah. in, in faulty logic, but we can't help you to understand it without accepting mm -hmm. yeah. Revelation. So this is this part mm -hmm. of the issue here yeah. is that we can only employ um, consistency arguments to show mm -hmm. that it's consistent, or rather maybe that on a it's safer bet, it's not inconsistent, not mm -hmm. irrational, but we can't actually help to, um, you know, Revelation is ultimately um, a gift of the Holy Spirit, so mm -hmm. we can't, um, when talking in, you know, pure philosophy without without arguing based on Revelation, we can't bring that understanding to a higher level. Right. Well, I think um, Caleb was actually saying something a little bit differently. I think Caleb was saying not that he can't comprehend it, I think he's saying it doesn't make sense. And it's and that's so why I'm like confused, that's yeah. why we don't toss it. That's why we kind of the, the, we use the term ultimate sacrifice because mm -hmm. the only thing that's good enough for to satiate God is God. So if but, we have if he's sacrificing mm -hmm. himself to himself, the only thing that's going to make a sacrifice that's good enough for himself is himself. So we have but, many sacrifices in the Old Testament. I mean, the ultimate sacrifice of Jesus, which is himself. But I'm not certain how that the part that I'm confused is. Like I'm confused both on how that operates with the whole mm -hmm. trinity part and also how that and this this might be a little bit of a separate issue but how that does anything so like so, he's making a sacrifice but is but he's that like yes he's making a sacrifice but it doesn't seem like there's a sacrifice being made that's okay. part of where like you're saying because he's doing because he's sending he's orchestrating it are you saying that that's not actually a sacrifice? well it's 
he's inflicting this thing on himself, mm -hmm. but it's also... Like, you also can't really say that you're, he's inflicting this on a part of himself, but it's not being inflicted on the other aspect, and it's... It's true it's not being inflicted on the Father and the Spirit, that's correct. Well, right, but it is being inflicted on God, but it's also, like... The, the whole mechanics of it doesn't... It, it seems... It's just not clicking for me. Yeah. So this is, this is again, where we, we kind of... So you have two separate, like, kind of issues, mm -hmm. is what you just said. So there's kind of this understanding of the Trinity, and as we understand the Trinity, we're going to have to... Like, it's something that, at its core, if you want to understand it with core philosophy, like Ben was saying, you, you won't be able to because it's not something that our human minds can entirely wrap around. Mm -hmm. But how that applies to the Gospel... Um, is that under under justice justice says that each mm -hmm. crime must be punished mm -hmm. right and so because god is just he sent the person of the son to be the sacrifice and so you're saying like you know sacrificing to himself he's sacrificing himself to himself in order like and he's like fulfilling it with the wrath of himself right mm -hmm. um and it's kind of like this like why is why is he, why can't he just like kind of erase it all Right? But I think we need to understand that justice shows that wrongs demand a right and must be retributed. And so the son on the cross, right? So if we, if we mm -hmm. kind of like toss aside the fact that we can't philosophically understand the Trinity, mm -hmm. kind of push that to the side for a second. We just talked about mm -hmm. the gospel, right? Then the son on the cross is the one perfect man, right? Fully mm -hmm. God, fully man. The one person that was completely perfect to uphold the law and therefore does not deserve any of the wrath of God that we do, right? Mm -hmm. Because we are sinners and because we have fallen short of God's glory, we deserve the wrath of God because it's his justice, because wrongs demand to be punished. That's what justice is. And so because God is eternally just, we need to understand that and we have to accept that the punishment of our sin is God's wrath. However, God in knowing that, recognized that need and came down as the son put on flesh and dwelt among us, lived mm -hmm. the perfect life that wasn't deserving of God's wrath, and then went to the cross. And when he was on the cross, if he was just murdered by Romans, people were murdered by Romans all the time. That mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily mean that we are saved because of that, right? Mm -hmm. Like if some random dude died, like a year before Jesus did, my eternity isn't affected. However, because Christ died on the cross, he was crucified, but the wrath of God was dumped out on him and so because of that all of the wrath of God towards sin all of the hatred of God towards sin was poured out on his earthly manifestation on earth on the being or on the person of the son all of that wrath from the father the the one who is the divine judge the just judge was poured out onto the son and so because of that we have reconciliation so because justice says that wrongs demand to be punished, someone needed to take that punishment, and it's either us or God, right? Mm -hmm. so, but God took it as the incarnate son. Yeah. So so uh, there's, a, there's a couple of things, and I think talking about that after the, the whole stuff, um, but I, I think the, the, the main thing, talking about the, the Trinity or try, trying to keep it focused on the, just for now, the topic that we're on, uh, the part I'm not quite understanding is how that's like when it's often talked about as it being a sacrifice or um, like the, the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. But I'm not I'm not certain how because at, at the end he's going to end up still being God, mm -hmm. and I'm not I'm not certain like he he was resurrected as well, mm -hmm. so he didn't so he also like didn't. Die. So it wasn't like God. Yeah. Yeah, so it's like he died, but he wasn't always. Dead. That's. Yeah. It's, it, I'm not saying so, that's a sacrifice. So yes. So that's thinking of sacrifice purely as Christ on the cross. Mm -hmm. That's the sacrifice. Just well, Jesus being murdered you, by Romans. Well, so what even we need to taking the wrath of God. Mm -hmm. Like that would be God is inflicting His wrath on Himself, mm -hmm. but the outcome is still gonna he it's. He's an eternal and infinite being. I'm not certain how, however much wrath he could come up with could have any matter or effect on himself, anyways. Or like, what what does? Well, I mean, pain what, pain hurts, right? 
like if you smash your head into the wall, you're inflicting punishment on yourself, and that's going to hurt. And like you might not have super lasting effects, but, like that compromise your identity as a person. But does that? But, how does that apply or work with an infinite being? Like even even if we're saying that there's like some crazy like even if we put a insanely high number of like ten billion or go up to the concept of infinity, mm. is that he is an infinite being himself? I'm not certain how that. So. What's, yeah. I, what I think is not clear is can I make kind of an analogy here? I think what's going back and forth here. So, um, it's kind of like Caleb was asking a question about like mechanical pencils, and you're explaining him what's the point of a me mechanical pencil and what it does, but he wants to know how a mechanical pencil works. And so you actually have to start making distinctions between the mechanical pencil, between the springs and the lead that's in it and the plastic that's in it. Okay. Yeah. So, um, in the same way here, uh, he mm -hmm. understands that God. Um, Okay, how do I how do I get rid of a, a, a rat a rat that bad? Well, that can't ever be paid off. Well, you need something infinite to pay it off. God's infinite, but how does God pay it to Himself and also sacrifice yes. to Himself? So He wants to get at the inner mechanics here, yeah. and this is why I think um, this is where I think Thomism comes very helpful because we make all those tiny tiny little distinctions that everyone gets annoyed at. Mm -hmm. um, what I would say is this: is that the reason why it's actually efficacious is because when we say God died on the cross. We can mm -hmm. say that, and that's a true expression in one sense. Mm -hmm. But then there's a secondary sense, and where we want to get more precise about it, we say that God, in the per in the second person of the Trinity, Jesus mm -hmm. Christ, died in his human nature, because human nature can die. And that's the mechanics. Okay. Yeah, I, I guess... So therefore, it's not that God himself is sacrificing himself, it's that the second person of the Trinity, who is distinct from the first person of the Trinity, is sent, becomes incarnate, takes on human nature, and that human nature is what actually dies, and the divine effects of his infinite nature are communicated to that, and that is what leads up to infinite merit. And that's how he can also pay for the sins on behalf of us, as a man. Yeah. I mean, I, Caleb, what you're asking is, why is, like, is so, the nature of the atonement, like, yeah. what... Yeah. So I, I think it, Why the, was this necessary yeah. in the first place, and what did it cost? Well, so that that's that's a separate that's kind of a separate so part of that I'm trying to I'm trying to keep that question separate from what I'm currently confused about here. It's more of like uh, to use the, to use the mechanical pencil analogy. Uh, it's like you're describing like I'm I'm trying to understand how this mechanical pencil operates, mm -hmm. but. You're telling me that you can't have, it's not like you can't describe the spring and the other aspects or like the lead of the pencil. Like, like with God, you can't separate it or describe those separate parts because they're God, even though there's still a spring and also the lead and also the outer casing. And the, that's, well, if that makes sense. Well, break down because the thing is a pencil is a pencil by virtue of its parts, which can be br brought apart. But let's just right. talk about but, understanding the pencil and actually breaking it yeah. apart. But with God, you can't break them apart, but we yeah. can understand those distinctions. Yeah. And those distinctions mm -hmm. are that there are three persons and one divine essence, and one of those persons, the Son, became man and took on what's called a nature, a fusis, mm -hmm. which is like a principle of operation, and all the things that come with that. So God took on, the second person took on a divine, uh, a human yeah. nature, and became man and assumed all that comes with the human nature, a human body, a human soul, uh, a human will, and as a man, died. Because men, men can die, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, and God assumed a, a, a human nature, which is a man. Okay. And so but therefore, it is possible for God, in his, it, God, the second person, to die in his human nature. But the, the issue is, like, you're talking about, like, God in his second nature died in a second person or a second person and but, in a second person within a second nature but the the part that's confusing is also parts of him didn't die but you can't say you that know? parts of him didn't die because there's not parts this is precisely and that's, where the mystery actually enters in because we can, this is this is the point where the where the mm -hmm. where the mystery ends which is the real mystery is how does the divine nature communicate with the human nature Mm -hmm. And how is it all ultimately still unified? That's where it breaks, because we cannot, we, our distinctions, we are mm -hmm. complex beings. There's a, a, there's a saying, mm -hmm. we had a, a, a Dominican friar come here named Dominic Legge, he, mm -hmm. he said something funny, uh, which is, um, God is simple, we're, com we're, com we're complex, we're complicated, mm -hmm. that's why we can't understand them. 
because we're the ones with complicated notions that can be broken apart. God just understand, understands himself simply. Okay. I, th I think that might be where the issue, because it seems like this whole mystery thing makes the whole part of the resurrect like, it just seems to muddy the waters with what exactly is happening to me. Because he's dying, like part of him is dying, but you can't say a part of him is dying. God has no but he parts. Did, that's what I'm saying. You can't say a part of him is dying because there's no well, parts. Right, so but you, then you just say his, Christ's human body, his human nature died, right? But that's why I was like, what does yeah, that? So, do you believe in the soul? So, I, for the sake of argument, I, we are. I'm willing to grant that for now. Like for the for the well, for the sake of the argument. When your human body dies, if you believe in the soul, your soul doesn't. Yeah. So yeah. that would be a way to. I mean, do you, could you grant that if you believe in the soul? Yeah, if we're starting with the soul, I could understand that, but then... Or if we were to, like, think that, about it... But if, if that's the case, the body isn't really me, right? That would, I would be the soul well, that's so, inhabiting this body. So, so like, what if your break, hand was... Your, in your current <laughs> atheistic, materialistic framework, <laughs> if your hand is necrosing, you wouldn't say that you have necessarily died, correct? No. But your hand has certainly died. Yeah, like the cells in my hand But granted, dying. that's a part of you... So this, this is the analogy, analogy. Saint Thomas uses, by the way. Sorry to interrupt okay, this, you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, mm -hmm. I'm thinking in forms. Um. So, so, but then yeah. this, the difference is going to work. Rephrase it. Can Jesus I? experienced his human body dying. Mm -hmm. However, his you soul. Like that, there shouldn't be so much confusing, because when you t when you start talking about you know, yep. the immortal essences dying. Yeah, that's a breakdown. Yeah. Even, even but, if okay. you, like they yeah. say you believe in a, a moral soul, it can't die. Yeah. So, he tasted death. but I think I think your your breakdown is that like if if only the human nature of Jesus is dying, how the heck is that a sacrifice? Well, it's the human nature is dying, and God we could say God experiences the human nature dying, yeah. or yeah. but then also it's like like in his. In God's infinity, died. or like his, the whole concept of him, how does that? So and him putting the punishment on that, the wrath. But how does that? So Jesus like, actually takes on human nature. So it's not like this just little thing in God, right? Like that becomes he, like Jesus is forever now. He has that human nature. Right? He took that on. So, and, and it's not like that's a little part of Jesus any more that, than being human is a little part of you. That's just, you are human. Jesus just is human and also is divine. So his experience of death isn't going, in, in his human nature, isn't any different from your experience of death just because he also has the divine essence. He has more perspective on what that means, yeah. right? But... Mm -hmm. He actually, be, like, actually became a man and had experiences like we have. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I mean, like, like but, this is fundamentally, like, what is the incarnation and what is, you know, what is, how is, yeah. what are the mechanics yeah. of the end? And also, like, when you're saying, like, he has experiences like we have, I'm also not 100% certain how that would fully operate as well, because it would feel like his perspective or, like, the context would just simply be different due to him being God as well? well yeah, I mean, that's a, so that's a third but, question, which is how does God's omniscience, for example, interact with the human mm -hmm. nature of Christ? Yeah. Which is another, like, huge debate question, mm -hmm. right? Like, like yeah. every single one of these questions you're bringing up, we could talk about for an entire Yeah. Game. I, I recognize those are all uh, major things. I'm also, I'm pretty certain we've and I think, I, I think, um, in general, I think probably we would mostly agree that from your perspective, like, there's a lot of theology that answers mm -hmm. all these questions, right? And we wouldn't expect someone who doesn't accept the theology to, mm -hmm. like, we're, like, so many steps beyond, like, mm -hmm. the first step of 
considering being you know, a Christian. I, mm-hmm. Like, we're many steps beyond that. So, um, I don't know that it's it's hard to start from scratch and get mm-hmm. all the way to a robust doctrine of the Trinity. Mm-hmm. You know I mean? That's kind of what we're trying to do yeah, here. Yeah, starting in yeah. calculus when you haven't built up all the algebra and basic yeah, math yeah, is quite yeah. difficult. Can I ask Caleb a question? Mm-hmm. Caleb, I was thinking about your mm-hmm. question, and I'm wondering if it's also, is it sort of not understanding or acknowledging God's method to say this? In other words, you're saying, well, so, well why does that do anything? But is the question really... Why is it that God uses, you know, Jesus, the Son of God, as mm-hmm. a substitute, God made man, to die? Why is that the method, right? Yeah. Why so, is God using yeah. that? Why is He saying this is how I'm uh, going to uh, say? So that is. So that's a bit of a separate separate is that, thing. So is that yeah. part of the question? Your well, question? so so I'm kind of uh, for the conversation that we're initially having right now. I'm kind of accepting that this is the method okay. that would be necessary. Okay. Okay. Uh, that that is a separate thing that it, like. Yeah. That's a separate thing that was kind of the um, part where I was like separating it up off, like why the resurrection was necessary, or not the resurrection, why was, why was you know, the crucif- crucifixion, why was that necessary, or the justice part of that? Right. That's, I'm, for the current conversation, You're I am taking, I am, uh, for the sake of argument, allowing the, okay. like, saying that this is the necessary thing. Okay. So it's, it's not so much of that it's, like functionally assuming that this is necessary what exactly how is it, is it e- like what exactly is it doing and how is it like how is part of it is like how is it a sacrifice because yeah so you're asking how this is a valid method right yeah so it's like assuming that this is a necessary method how how is yeah, like, I mean, it's the, just the whole question of the atonement yeah yeah mm-hmm. And, and to answer that, there are quite a few different Christian theories on exactly how that would play yeah. out that rely on some, like, different frameworks. Yeah. But, I mean, the substantial, you know, what is the atonement, at least mm-hmm. from a human perspective of what does it do, is fairly clear and yeah. um, not really debated yeah. among Christians. So the, how yeah. it works is debated. Yeah, the how it works is, it doesn't, I, I'm not certain that there's, like, like, to, to uh, I, I guess sum up the part where it, I'm not seeing how this would work to do something. Like assuming that, yeah. assuming that this thing needs to be I done. Comment on that. I'm not certain how this would do that. It doesn't seem like I it think would. Mason has a so, so go ahead. First of all, I've appreciated listening. I'm a, this is my first time here, so this has been. What's your name again? Mason. Mason. Hi, Mason. My name is Mason, so... Um, I'm Caleb, nice to meet you. <laughs> nice to meet you, Caleb. So, yeah, first of all, I think sometimes, for me, I realize, like, what are we even talking about? Like, I was, mm-hmm. it was hard for me to follow. Maybe y'all were keeping up the whole time. But I think one thing we're potentially missing is that it wasn't just, like, death and wrath on the cross. It was also a separation. So God is this, you know, this three, or, like, the three in one that have always been together, have community together, love together, and... Jesus says on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And that means to turn away from, to separate from. And so there was this not only death and wrath and experience of sin, but then that leads to separation. So he he and himself is separated from himself. So that is maybe that, does that add anything to this conversation? Well, well, this is kind of why, because part of the idea of the Trinity, though, is you can't separate the parts of God. Like, that's not God anymore. Yeah. So. Yeah. And so, so that's like, I can. I, so I think Ben has a comment, and I then just I think we're. I yeah, I, we're, 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 we're 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 barely over. That's why I was. One final comment. <laughs> Nobody can come after me because <laughs> <laughs> this will mess up everybody. Ben has the last one. Got it. Uh, Got it. <laughs> big surprise. The uh, incarnation, and or rather the um, specifically the dying of Christ on the cross, uh, it wasn't actually necessary. Um, so we mean different things when we use the word necessary um, in philosophy well, is the best way to, to uh, you're talking about, are you talking about the so, philosophical yeah, necessary but, how, like, forced into using right and, and, but in mm-hmm. most ways in which you use necessary philosophically I mean both, yeah, it's not, know, logically and metaphysically it wasn't necessary in yeah. either analysis it was necessary maybe insofar as it was expedient mm-hmm. but 
we don't think that it was yeah. necessary. Yeah. So it's last the word uh, <laughs> to to clarify and to confuse everybody if you're confused by that. Yeah, actually, yeah. um, <laughs> but you should not believe that it's necessary because yeah, it's not. In and most mm -hmm. to just kind of help or wrap, maybe I to build on that just slightly. Mm -hmm. like because you can't have last word. Andrew has last word. We think of the we describe the atonement as like some kind of transaction. Like mm -hmm. there's some law or rule that God is following. Like, oh mm -hmm. no, I can't save people without doing something. Mm -hmm. so yeah. I think that's probably not right. The right way to think about it. Mm -hmm. So, and that might help you avoid this. Like, I don't understand this mechanism of like why does like he kill himself and then that somehow like magically like gives something that he can then like save people with. Mm -hmm. I would say just don't think about it that way. And maybe we can talk later about Yes. So with that being said, it's yep. ten o'clock, so everybody go to refs. Yeah. 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 Yeah.